he goes, he goes, 5G effects have in fact been confirmed as having a negative effect on health. And this, and this is only new technology. How can anyone have the cheek to claim that this won't affect your health after 10 years of exposure? And then he, he really warms to his task. He goes, it's nothing but a new world order Illuminati trying to impose complete control over people. The people are beginning to rise and I guarantee there will be more and more 5G towers being burned. Hello and welcome to another telecoms.com podcast. First one for about a week and a half because we had Good Friday and I was off and we just didn't get it together in general. But here we are recording it on a Tuesday because we're that committed to you, dear audience. Um, everyone's still alive, not coughing, looking all right. Good to see you guys. So uh, I'll, I'll just steam in. I, obviously, I haven't been writing for the last week, so I'm even more in your two's hands than usual. Um, but I think what we'll start off with, Jamie did an excellent one about a week or so ago about these nutters who started burning down tele telecoms masks because they think 5G is, is the devil's work or some stuff like that. So uh, I think we've got to look into that because it's bloody hilarious. And I, I think, you know, this what's going on with this uh, pandemic is just making people much more suggestible to the most crazy ass conspiracy theories. So that seems to be a great example of it. Then um, I wrote I wrote today a bit about uh, Huawei seems to be worrying a little bit because uh, general opinion in the West seems to be hardening towards certainly the, the Chinese Communist Party and that always tends to that always tends to um, uh, sort of do some collateral damage at least to Huawei. So we'll have a little talk about that. And then uh, what was the other thing? Oh yes, contact tracing. So um, during this pandemic, they want to work out who's been in contact with who to have, try and map what the spread of the of the illness might be and a brilliant way to do that of course is through smartphones because they've all got gps chips in them they're all on the whole time they're all connected the whole time um so we look at some of the at some of the sort of technologies that are being employed there and maybe also some of the data privacy implications so i'm going to i'm going to hand it off straight to jamie on the 5g nutters why don't you tell us about your story? Tell us about some of the comments. You've had a ton of comments on that story and maybe some further mentalness that's happened since then. Over to you, mate. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I don't entirely know where it's all come from. I mean, um, uh, a lot of people are attributing um, the, the, the big flare up to David Icke, uh, the former BBC presenter, sort of turned conspiracy theorist. Um, but there were there were sort of like rumblings about these conspiracy theories prior to um, Ike doing this big interview uh, about three or four weeks ago that got a ridiculous amount of downloads and listens. Um, now, eff effectively, you just got a load of people just burning down burning down uh, telco uh, infrastructure, um, which. Worth bearing in mind, some of the infrastructure they're burning down isn't 5G. Um, it is actually pretty much everything. Um, but then also uh, verbal and physical threats to staff who are out, uh, you know, BT staff and Vodafone in particular, um, who are actually out doing work on the infrastructure, not necessarily again and highly unlikely to be deploying 5G infrastructure, but it all comes down to these uh, sort of conspiracy theories that um, coronavirus is somehow either caused or accelerated by the deployment of 5G networks. Um, it's it's all half truth, pseudoscience. Uh, it's being endorsed by um, by by ill-informed celebrities or uh, journalists um, who do be, uh, morning television shows. Um, but it, it's just. I, quite frankly, I just can't see an end to it, and we're going to be have to be dealing with this for for months. I imagine it's kind of like the the mobile phones gives you cancer uh, argument all over again from twenty five years. Um, it's it's truly truly baffling, and some of the people, I mean, some of the some of the comments we've had and the emails I've had have been truly truly remarkable. Uh, the way in which um, they, they, they believe these stories. It, 
it, it, it boggles the minds. And I, I think it all it ultimately all comes down to one thing. And this is the same with the privacy issues that some of the internet giants have faced, um, the backlash against Facebook a couple of years ago. The, 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 a lot of these issues are all down to a lack of education. Um, no one in the, in the industry, uh, in the general public, really understands how Facebook makes money, so they're a bit skeptical about them. They don't understand the trade-off between data and uh, or sort of freemium and sort of like free services and handing your data across. And they don't understand how 5G works. So therefore, they're willing to believe a lot of things. And maybe they're a bit bored. They're stuck in, stuck in their living room and they're just looking for something exciting. So they're, they're grasping at something that is completely implausible. Um, but yeah, but it doesn't help so that you've got you know, pricks like uh, Eamon Holmes saying to a million people on ITV that, um, that, that mainstream media is, is, it was very Trump-esque, uh, questioning the validity of mainstream, mainstream media. So it makes, it's just another half-truth that the conspiracy theories theorists have to work with. It's truly remarkable. I can't understand where people's logic is coming from, that they actually believe this stuff. No, I think, um, I think everything you've said, uh, I, I, I completely agree with. I'd add on top of that, just when people get freaked out and they get anxious and they get panicked, I think they start clutching at straws. Um, and as you say, everyone's got a lot of spare time. Everyone can sit at home um, just sort of obsessing over stuff that they perhaps wouldn't even bother thinking about because they were too busy before. I mean, one thing, you, you compare it to the, uh, to the um, sort of telecoms, to the sort of wireless giving you cancer stuff that's been around for decades. Now, I, we know that's bollocks, but at least all they've got is the wrong end of the electromagnetic spectrum on that one. You know, radiation at very high frequencies, you know, UV, um, gamma rays, X-rays, and all that sort of thing does give you cancer. But it's, it's the mean, same thing. It's the same argument they're using for coronavirus. Is it? That it's a part. Of, well, part of it is one of the one of the questions that the the, the uh, uh, they're, they're arguing that it's I it's non ionizing and ionizing again. You can't prove that five G is non ionizing. Therefore, it's the immune system. No, but this is what people are saying. Right. Um, but that's so, that's you know, bonkers. I, I know. I know. I mean, I, I see that the the argument about cancer, which I suspect is where some of this comes from, because there've been health concerns surrounding you know mobile technologies in the past, and this goes all the way back to three G days, I think, and even Wi Fi. There's been stuff about it can cause cancer. Now, I, I I know that's been dismissed by groups like the World Health Organization, but like Scott says, you can you can sort of see where that comes from because there there are radio waves there. You know, we know that. In, at some levels, those can cause uh, th those can be carcinogenic. So you can sort of see why there's a fear about th this equipment being built out. The, what, going from that to a virus, a, an organism, you know, a, an actual living thing, is just completely mad. I mean, it's like I don't know how you get from one to the other at all. Really, it just seems. I've got it. I know how you do. Uh, well, have you ever seen um, War of the Worlds? You know, War of the Worlds. Oh, I see. Down, I see. Well, they beat them. Yeah. Through, like, I mean, I, I think that these these concerns about, you know, it's people with poor education, like you say, but they've they've heard some of the health concerns to do with cancer and somehow they've got to coronavirus from that. 5G is quite new. I suspect this whole Huawei, China thing's got something to do with it as well. I mean, there's, you know, the fact that 5G is always always gets linked with China. We've had Huawei's name in the paper for a couple of years as a company that's a sinister force behind 5G technology, according to you know the mainstream media so i suspect that's probably got something to do with it but but it really is just just toast and, and who the people are who are actually going out and burning down masks i don't know I mean, it's one thing to kind of be tweeting about it and saying silly things in um you know on social media but to actually go out and start attacking telecom engineers and burning down masks and apparently it's not just a uk thing now there's some stuff at the weekend about this going on in the netherlands as well so yeah Kind of wonder where it's going to go from here because because once this stuff starts it, it becomes it sort of self perpetuating you know kind of it can, there's a danger it can get, get worse and worse and then we end up with you know five G's got enough problems as it is at the moment with operators not spending much potentially and spectrum auctions being delayed now they've got all this crap to deal with it's uh, kind of the last thing it needs really I think I mean they're all it's it's, it's so idiotic I mean I think I think I mean the 
the, the, the people who don't actually, I mean, this is, this is basically a symptom of the social media era. You, you, uh, how many people on social media actually, uh, you know, take for gospel something that's been shared and they see and they like and they reshare or they reshare it by, you know, um, uh, they reshare it on purpose, but with an intention of tongue, tongue in cheek. You know, how often do you see people on social media who have shared something by the onion, believing it to be true, just because someone else has shared it and someone else has shared it? You know, I, th I think it's uh, not many people are actually uh, uh, are actually digging deeper to see what it actually means and just taking something on the surface of it. But at the same time, the the industry hasn't done a very good job of explaining what. 5G is, why 5G is different to 4G. Um, and for instance, like someone someone was talking about this a couple of weeks ago. Well, it was one of the one of the idiots who was commenting on the story. Um, they were talking about, you know, the the, the the airwaves that were that they that they're using are, you know, a magnitude higher, so much higher in frequency than 4G. And what mo and it's because it's complicated. Physics, spectrum usage. How to make better use of it? How to apply it? It's really, really complicated. But what people, most people, don't understand is a lot of these, uh, a lot of the midband spectrum is being used anyway. So it's not. This isn't new spectrum and new airwaves that are being applied. It's that they're being repurposed and refarmed. And even when you go up to, you know, when you go up to, let's say, uh, you know, the, the millimeter waves and you know up to eighty gigahertz, you know, that's still hundreds if not thousands of megahertz gigahertz away from what would be deemed as ionizing um uh, frequencies and the the dangerous frequencies but it's that it's that it's that order of magnitudes that people don't understand and has never been explained to anyone the the industry has just been quite bad at saying this is how something works and you know just assuming that people will just go all right that's fine Maybe yeah. maybe one of the problems is that it's not that different from 4G, and they, they don't really want to say that. It's it's not that yeah. different from 4G. Because my neighbour was asking me about this, and she was sort of saying, well, how's over the fence? How's all this got started and everything? And why, why, is it why is it so different from 4G? And I said, well, it isn't actually that different from 4G. I mean, the point you were just making, a lot of these spectrum bands are being repurposed. Um, you know, it's slightly higher, but it's not, not, you know, when you look at that scale and you look at the stuff that's, dangerous it's 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 so far away from it the kind of stuff that gets used for x-rays and all that yeah it, it, it's not a huge difference but the industry doesn't really want to go around saying well actually 5g is not that much different from 4g it's just kind of a souped up version of it and you know the spectrum's slightly higher but it's not that much it, it maybe it's not the story they want to tell but they kind of it would help no one's actually turned around and told people look there are risks because because to be there are risks to to radio frequency radiation um, you know that's a, that that you can there there are ill effects. That's why they have health and safety when you're looking at field engineers, um, and why you know there are there are risks involved. Um, but I don't think anyone actually wants to admit it. And the other thing, uh, I mean, and also you've got to be you've got to be pretty close for those um, sorts of things to be uh, to be uh, to have any real ill effect. Like some one of my friends was asking me um, about whether there is any any damage that can be done through these antennas, and I said, "Well, yeah, theoretically, yes, but unless you're fucking sitting on top of one, um, you know, you're not you're not gonna, and you you know, it's it's on the right side of the concrete wall from you." Um, so, so I just said to him, "You know, look and look under your ass. I mean, what have you got there? Is it a sofa cushion or is it a five G antenna? If it's a sofa cushion, you're fine." Um, you know, unless you're sat on top of it, it's not going to cause you any damage. I bet that put his mind at ease. Thanks. That any, that anyone's tried to address this. Well, I mean, I used to, for a couple of years, I taught um, GCSE level science. And the electromagnetic spectrum, everyone gets taught when they're like 14 or 15. Granted, 99% of people will forget it because if you don't keep doing physics, you want that crazy abstract shit out of your head as quickly as possible. But, you know, electromagnetic spectrum, you've just got radio, micro, infrared, visible light, ultraviolet, um, X-ray, gamma ray. That's not that complicated. There's only about seven stages of the electromagnetic spectrum that you need to learn. But I can understand people who haven't remembered that or, or haven't remembered that the ionizing part is down at the X-ray, gamma ray part. When they hear microwaves flying around in the air, they're like, hold on a sec. 
use microwaves for cooking baked potatoes. What's that going to do to my head? And Jamie, you make a good point. I wrote a piece, um, uh, I think a couple of months ago, going, turns out 5G is all right. Um, and all this, and this study that was done by the official body that looks into this shit just looked at heat because at that lower frequency, it's about transfer of heat, not transfer of potentially um, mutagenic uh, radiation. So that's where you're right. You know, if, if your mate was sitting on a 5G mast, his ass might get warmed up. Uh, and that's what they've looked at is specific measurements, like the amount of heat transferred per unit of time per volume of, of sort of tissue and all that sort of thing. And they've concluded that even if you're using um, microwaves from a handset you got right next to your head, it's not going to cook your brain. Presumably, you'd, you'd start knowing about it cooking your brain before it did any damage and you'd chuck the handset across the room. But there you go. But you can see how people who don't get all that can imagine I'm putting something next to my head that emits microwaves. That's probably not a great idea. And as you say, Jamie, all you need to do is explain that this is the, the, the power from one of those compared to a microwave oven is probably a billionth or something like that. And, and then maybe people would chill. But then again, as you say, maybe they wouldn't because it's a good, good fun to chase conspiracy theories right now. Well, yeah, but the thing is, like, I mean, this, this is sort of like uh, this sort of argument it is applicable to every every aspect of the technology world, irrelevant whether we're talking IT or engineering or, or, or architecture or anything along those lines. We've evolved as a society to a place where we don't need to understand how things work. You know, if you, if you think like 500 years ago, if you had a horse, you know, you'd, you'd understand how to keep that horse healthy. Um, but, you know, as soon as cars came along and things became complicated, uh, or much more complicated, mechanics started appearing and then all of a sudden no one knows how to fix a car. Now that seems all right to us, um, but that that sort of like thinking that people will take, uh, will just use technology without needing to understand it is just applied everywhere nowadays. And I think, I don't think that it is applicable to mobile and to the digital economy because it is so intrusive and it is there are so many different consequences, not even talking about health, about privacy, about security, about financial. You know, every people need to understand how it works. You can't just say, here's a phone, it'll go faster. Here's an internet service, don't worry, you won't get robbed. You know, the, you need to actually explain to people how you get from A to B and why it's better and how it works. And that, I think, is the fundamental. I mean, this is one of the reasons why, let's say, uh, older generations don't trust Internet banking. Just like 30 years ago, older generations wouldn't have trusted an ATM or, uh, you know, that, or they, they would have stuck with their, their checkbook because it's the thing that they know and they, they, they trust it and they're secure with it. You know, the, you've got I'll to teach them on the journey. Mm. You've got to take people on a journey if you're going to ask them to, uh, to, 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 to radically change the fundamentals of their life. And that's what, and no one seems to have done that. <clears throat> so, Ian, Ian you, you covered this as well. Did, did, you, get any, uh, did you get any sort of uh, responses on the story or on social media or anything like that def defending this position? Uh, a bit on social media, but I didn't get anybody. I didn't get the sort of flag that Jamie got. I mean, I didn't. I didn't have his. Uh, I didn't have his deluded scouts headline. So, yeah. which obviously <laughs> ran a few people up. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, I. It's it's funny where it comes from. I don't know. It, it, I mean, it's it sounds like a lot of the people coming back and and commenting on that are responding are obviously not industry people there because it's hard to imagine anybody who actually works in the sector thinking this. I mean, the, the articles that we write dismissing it and lampooning the view are, are, are pretty much imagine everybody in the industry who goes to conferences and reads our stuff is nodding their heads. There's nobody there who's going to be going, oh, actually, you know, there's a concern here. So, um, but I mean, I, I agree with Jamie. I think you need, you need, I mean, this is a, this is a weird one, this, this 5G coronavirus. I think it's kind of out there in Mickey Mouse land. I really do. But I do agree that you, you need to give people some, certainly for things like internet banking and getting the trust of older generations in technology. And, you know, is it safe to use broadband? And how do you, how do you differentiate, you know, different types of email to make sure that you're not being scammed and all that sort of stuff? I think that's important for getting broader acceptance of technology, and especially now with what's going on. Um, this, this, 
COVID-19 and, and, you know, disease carrying 5G gear stuff is just really quite bizarre. I think it's, it's, it's just such a weird link. That's the, that's the thing that I find. I mean, and, and as I say, it probably comes from the health concerns that surround 5G originally to do with cancer, but to get from that to, to, to a, a living organism in, in technology equipment is just, it's yeah. just weird. It's like um, they've been smoking something very odd. I don't know, but. I think it just. I think it it's just. David goes, Icke, so you know. Well, yeah, David Icke, who, who thinks that the world's run by hit lizards in disguise or some shit like that. Yeah, exactly. So um, they're not stable people. Some of these people, are they? But that's the. I think that's the the real thing about let's call them conspiracy theories for want of a better word, but really sort of far, far stretching theories like that is that people have an anxiety and there's a basic need for there to be an answer. I think a lot of people really struggle with the concept of just shit happens and, and coincidence. And then, you know, like, here we are. I wanted to, before we move on from this subject, I wanted to read out some of the comments on Jamie's story because there are some absolute classics. The one that seems to have catalyzed the craziness is from some guy called Jeff. And he goes, he goes, 5G effects have in fact been confirmed as having a negative effect on health. And this, and this, is only new technology. How can anyone have the cheek to claim that this won't affect your health after 10 years of exposure? Then he, he really warms to his task. He goes, it's nothing but a new world order Illuminati trying to impose complete control over people. The people are beginning to rise, and I guarantee there will be more and more 5G towers being burned. And it's just like... So he was responsible for it, was he? Yeah. He's probably one of the arsonists. Oh, could be, or he could be a troll. I mean, this is the really weird thing about the internet. Uh, you know, and, uh, and Jamie, you were talking about like misinformation earlier. And I, I saw that you wrote a story while I was off about uh, YouTube and misinformation, and you got a few people pushing back on that. And I've written about the censorship and the misinformation thing as well. You know, at what stage do you designate something misinformation? At what stage is something shared in good faith or is it a troll or someone deliberately trying to sort of scam you or something like that there's just so much information flying around all over the place that you've really got to stay on top of your game i think we as journalists we naturally develop good habits of looking into something someone shared but i'm getting people sharing stories of me on social media going look 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 what's happening and then i just have to google it for a minute and see that it's been debunked but because it's so quick and easy to share, people are just following their sort of confirmation bias. They've already half reckoned something. They find something that seems to justify what they reckon, and they just share it without looking into it at all. So that's a real issue as well. I'm going to uh, move on then, as we've got that natural pause, and I briefly muted myself. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I'm going to move it on to, I mean, look, I'm, I'm not even going to apologize for something having a, a coronavirus angle because right now until we're allowed to leave the house that's all it's going to be but um i want to conflate our two richest sources of news which is coronavirus and huawei um and this is because i wrote a thing today um they got this quite senior guy in who used to be their global head of government affairs and they brought him out in to head up the comms just of the uk called uh, victor Zhang, I think. Um, and they brought him in at the start of the year, and that seemed to go well, because by the end of January, we'd sort of said, all right, we can have a bit of our way in the 5G networks, much to the consternation of, of President Trump and all that sort of thing. Um, but now he's written an open letter, clearly directed at sort of government regulators, official types, going, you know, don't let all this um, coronavirus stuff that's going on make you change your mind. And you sort you know, I don't need to explain it, but I'll, I'll spell out anyway. You'd think, well, why would Huawei be worried about that? No one's blaming Huawei for the coronavirus, except for Jamie's scouser and nutters. Um, but, the, but the thing is, what people have increasingly, and we spoke about this in the last um, pod, people are increasingly suspicious about China full stop in the West. I'm seeing, I'd say, about half of the material I see shared around on social media is people now sort of pointing a suspicious finger at China over this, that and the other. Obviously, the core thing being that they were they could have shared a lot more information 
about the initial uh, coronavirus outbreak and they could have done a lot more to contain it and all that sort of thing. I don't think it, I certainly don't know enough and I don't know if, don't think it's a position of this pod to make a strong comment on whether or not China could have done more. But now that's just sort of snowballing and, you know, there, there are all sorts of things going, there are all sorts of accusations being thrown at them. MPs and, and US politicians are going, you know, we've got to cut off ties. This is all part of some evil moustache twirling grand plan. Um, and, and because the general supposition, and I'm not saying whether it's right or wrong, is that every Chinese company is necessarily um, beholden to the Chinese state, i.e. they've got to do the Chinese state's bidding when they're asked to, any suspicion that's thrown at the Chinese state is also thrown at Huawei. So that's why this guy wrote this this letter this morning, and it's already been sort of scorned by various MPs. But I'll, um, you know, I've banged on for a bit. Ian, I know that you've written a, a little bit about the effect of the pandemic on 5G and, and maybe on Huawei as well. So let me pass the ball to you for a bit. Yeah, I mean, similar angle. I saw Victor Zhang's letter. I noticed that they'd also named um, Michael Rake. I think he was a former BT uh, chairman as, as a member of the board today. So trying to trying to do quite a lot on the PR front. I mean, there's, there's various things going on, like you say. There's there's, there's a kind of anti, anti-China anti backlash, I think, going on at the moment. Uh, and there's quite a few things I noticed that happened over the weekend. So I, I saw... I can never pronounce their name rightly, but I think it's, is it Margareta Vestager, the EU competition commissioner, had done an interview with, with the FT where she'd suggested that it might be a good idea for national governments to take stakes in companies that are, that are sort of vulnerable to takeovers by Chinese firms at the moment. Um, and that, that comes off, I think that comes only a few weeks after Spain had actually made some legislative moves to stop to stop Telefonica from from sort of being taken over while its share price is so low, you've you've also got this guy in the UK, uh, Tom. Tu- Again, I'm going to get his name wrong, but it's Tugendell, I think the chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee, who's a real sort of anti-China uh, individual. But um, there's this investigation going on at the moment into a company called Imagination Technologies, which I think's been connected with Apple in the past. And I didn't realise they got taken over in 2017 by a company that appears to be controlled by the Chinese state. So all of a sudden you've now got concern about sort of falling into Chinese government hands and whether that's a very good thing or not. And he's even sent out a tweet that I put in my story, I think at the weekend, he said, yeah, Beijing is exploiting the disarray caused by the coronavirus epidemic to take control of enabling tech that underpins the UK future. Um, so there's sort of various things going on. I mean, I, I think there's a, there's a sort of sense that you know, there are various conspiracy theories that I know, I know there's some crazy ones even that they were kind of behind the, the creation of this virus in the first place, which is, is as mad as the whole 5G stuff. But there's certainly, I think, a sense that, you know, among among hawks that China's may be exploiting circumstances at the moment for some kind of geopolitical and economic gains. And you, you've got other kind of weird stuff at the moment going on as well. I think there's reports of sort of water movements in Taiwanese waters. So... None of it really helps a company like Huawei, which is already kind of on the receiving end of, um, you know, is, is already kind of uh, feeling feeling a, a bit of pressure anyway from US and, and European officials who are against it. And, and, and therefore they've kind of popped up and done their bit. They can sort of sense, you know, maybe they can sense that these calls for them to be removed entirely and not even allow their percentage that they're allowed in the UK, that those could get stronger next few weeks and, and maybe some of the moves that Europe's made I mean if you've got the EU competition commission saying things like that who knows they could you know they could have um even tougher legislation coming in I suppose so yeah it's it's a difficult situation that they're in definitely at the moment and it's not going to get any easier for them soon I don't think well the the imagination thing I can tell you a bit more about them because I used to write about them quite a lot in a previous life they basically design graphics processing units, but for embedded applications. So everyone's heard of ARM, and everyone knows that ARM chips are in all phones. Well, imagination technology GPU designs are in most phones as well. Um, and they were nearly sent out of business. You know how Apple likes to play hardball with its suppliers? Well, imagination basically provided all the, the graphics processing uh, chips for iPhones. So 
and they were you know you know sometimes you get in in um in quarterly reports they talk about risk factors and they talk about when they're overexposed to one customer imagination were massively overexposed to apple and apple knew it and they tried to play hardball over negotiations and 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 cut a long story short um apple just pulled out of imagination started designing its own gpus which nearly sent them out of business but i think um so you could see how why they'd be ripe for for takeover um you know why someone like qualcomm or whatever didn't consider it i guess they're happy enough with their own G gpu stuff but you know you make a really good point everyone knows that stock markets have gone down the toilet um everyone knows that the west is all very heavily indebted I and mean, this is the biggest geopolitical fear is the west heavily indebted china's got tons of money i mean china's bought a lot of the debt of, of the us and all that sort of thing so in principle they could just run around buying up companies and this is the this has always been the central paradox with our antagonism um, towards huawei and towards the chinese is they're threatening to beat us by our own rules in other words we've got the belt and road initiative which is all about basically economic expansionism and if you want to put a harsher term on it economic imperialism but you know they're spending real money they're just buying stuff because they've got all the money um so while i think it's right that we should protect ourselves and you know we don't want to turn around one day and find all our infrastructure owned by a country that may have very different objectives to our own on the flip side it, they're doing it in the open market this stuff's for sale and they're buying it so so it's all a bit weird and, and and it's interesting the point you make about everyone getting super protectionist now i mean what a lot of people don't always consciously acknowledge about the eu is it's protectionist by nature anyway it's just protectionist towards the whole european bloc um well, it's, it's caused problems i mean i don't think a lot of people are going to be that sympathetic to what's what's going on because they would see you know, you've got you've got the competition commissioner now saying that national governments should take ownership of, of critical businesses to stop them from falling into Chinese hands. But if you look at the telecom sector on its own, you know, for years one of the criticisms about the EU's approach is this bit that a sort of very bumbling approach to regulating you know, opposed mergers and takeovers, and the criticism from from people who are quite anti Huawei as well as it happens is that that sort of weakened a lot of the players, and that you know we've got this very weak collection of you know of European operators and. I remember talking to somebody from a European operator who's quite senior, uh, I can't say who it was because it was off the record uh, a couple of years ago, saying that one of the concerns was if this carried on, that European tel telcos were going to become vulnerable to, to take over either by US or Chinese players. So people will look at the, at the, at the EU and say, well, you've, you've sort of brought this on yourselves to some extent through your misguided pro-consumer competition policy that you've had in place for years. And, and on the Huawei front, they also allowed, you know, people people like John Strand, our friend at John Strand would say, well, they allowed for a decade that through the whole 4G era, a company that's propped up by the Chinese state, undercutting Western rivals on, on price to become Europe's biggest supplier of communications equipment while Ericsson and Nokia were going into decline. And then all of a sudden this happens and you've got a potential crisis on your hands. Yeah, well, it's... I mean, it's such a big it's such a big issue, isn't it? Because when when they brought um, China into the World Trade Organization and all that sort of thing, the hope was that they would they would be a good global citizen by that trade would sort of bring everyone together. But you know, there does seem to be a lot of evidence that that China, for a lot of that time, has tried to cheat to some extent, whether it's through IP theft, whether it's through currency manipulation, whether it's through um, uh breaking the rules by supporting internal champions with sort of limitless credit lines all that sort of thing but but everyone knew that was happening it's not like everyone's just suddenly turned around and went what you, they were taking a piss since when you know everyone knew they, well, just, yeah, they didn't do anything about it i mean this is this is why people were calling for tougher sanctions against some against companies like huawei a lot of it wasn't driven by security concerns was it if you talk to some of the people who are opposed to Right. their reasons for not for not liking that company and, and ZTE is they say it sort of flouts international rules you know it doesn't play by the you know and you get this stuff about it, IP theft obviously and and you know dumping practices Chinese state subsidies all this sort of stuff comes out but that, those are some of the reasons why people were saying there should be a tougher line against this company and against other Chinese companies in the past 
the horse yeah. to carry thing is a bit of a sideshow almost, I think, in a way. Well, one other thing I want to say on that, and if you can hear a dog barking in the background, it's my dog that clearly isn't being punted regularly enough, um, is, uh, you know, money. There's lots of stories written about how many of our institutions, like academic institutions, are, are awash with Chinese money, and this is all part of that Belt and Road thing. Now, and I noticed that, you know, you said they just appointed this guy, Sir Mike Rake, to their board. Well, that board also consists of two other sirs and a lord. So I referred to them in my story, the Knights of the Huawei Table. Um, and, you know, it just seems interesting that we've got these bastions of the UK establishment joining that. And I, I've, I asked Huawei what they're getting paid, and I haven't heard back. But what do you reckon, guys? I reckon they're probably doing all right out of it, don't you? Yeah, no. I'll tell that to means, you. Yeah. <laughs> I can't see why else. I'm reminding myself yeah. the rhetorical question on this format is a completely stupid thing to do. My apologies. No, no one um, does anything so, for free, yeah? Yeah, well, quite. So so we've got all these, all these lords and sirs and, and God knows what else uh, joining their board to give it a, a sense of establishment legitimacy. But a flip side of, of looking at that is that's just a, a way, another illustration of how money can be used to to influence our supposedly most, I don't know, most entrenched institutions. But like I said, I don't know what they're getting paid. And I'm not suggesting they're only doing it for the money. They presumably believe that Huawei is a legit company and that's fine. But um, but I bet, get, I bet they're getting a few bob. That's all I've got to say. All right. Um, we'll move on to our last thing, which is, Jamie, you wrote um, recently wrote about Google and Apple uh, collaborating over a uh, an app that could help with things like contact tracing and generally help to deal with this pandemic. Why don't you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, it's basically um, uh, the 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 whole the whole uh, the whole industry and uh, pretty much every government around the world wants to use uh, technology and data to combat COVID nineteen, and you know obviously that's a very very good idea um but the big question is is it actually going to work um and this is one of the reasons why i quite like the fact that you've got google and apple coming together to partnership to create these first of all common apis um that can be used by the government but then also build in the idea of um sort of tracking <clears throat> tracking and tracing uh element uh software into the base level of the OS. Now, this isn't new though. Let's, let's not forget, every single country is attempting to create their own tracker uh, app at the moment. Um, but I think the European Data uh, Protection Supervisor turned around and said, well, the better way to do it is if you all come together and do one collaborative approach. And I think this is where this partnership could be incredibly beneficial. Politicians will squabble, they'll argue about who takes the leads, you know, who's going to be, you know, they will, they all want to do it their own way. But everyone can unite behind Apple and Google because realistically, private industry is better at doing these sorts of things than the, uh, the public sector. And hopefully this will lead to a more comprehensive um, approach and a faster solution to the COVID-19 problem. Um, but, you know, obviously I'm, I'm partly uh, partly assuming that I'm gonna I'm completely wrong there, and it's all gonna go tits up somewhere. <laughs> um, well, one way in which it could go tits up, from my point of view, is the data privacy side of it. Um, so, you know, we are all being tracked the whole time in principle. There's just the basic um, cell tower triangulation thing. Where, where police can use um, that, that geolocating data to solve crimes and that sort of thing. Then the fact that we've got a GPS chip, the fact that we've got Google Maps, the fact that we've got countless other location-specific apps. So that data is all there, and, and we have to make our peace with that. Where people get worked up, if you take, for example, the, the Cambridge Analytica thing, which I thought was a storm in a teacup, but the reason people got worked up wasn't that Facebook had got their data is that Facebook was selling their data onto a third party and that's where people get 
get worried is is when you become this commodity without your consent now granted this is different this isn't a commercial thing but there if if for example as, as i think you were suggesting unless i got it wrong jamie that they build it into the core os so that you're being tracked all the time whether you like it or not it does become something slightly sort of big brotherish about that so i think that's one area it could go tits up is, is that something that that worries you no, not in the slightest. Because number one, they can do that anyway. So I mean, you know, if that, if that, if anyone's got an issue with it being, uh, I think this is more the idea of the 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 the, the apps uh, being interoperable, being built into the foundation of the OS, and also about the Bluetooth tracing, because that's another thing which is um, which is going to be very good uh, or very beneficial in the sense that you know, if you are within. The perimeter of someone who's potentially infected you'll find out because they're blue they're blue the bluetooth tracing features um so but i mean i'm i'm not overly concerned about privacy in this because number one they're not doing to, they're not really offering any new functionality which they can't already do um and number two they have been very explicit there's this all this sort of thing is going to be opt-in um so the 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 I'm not particularly worried about it, but that's because we've got um, regulation in Europe, which is very pro-privacy. Perhaps if I was in the US, I'd be more worried about it. You know, they've got more of an opt-out culture than as opposed to an opt-in culture. So maybe that's something to be concerned about. But not the status quo isn't necessarily being broken with these new uh, with these new developments. Oops. Um, I, before I, before I ask you what you think, Ian, I just want to point out one thing to. Uh to sort of back my case, which is uh, an article I read in The Guardian, it was published yesterday. The headline is NHS Coronavirus App, Memo Discussed Giving giving Ministers Power to, quote, de-anonymize users. Um, and so there's gonna be some NHS app um, that's used to track all this stuff. Um, but in, in this stuff that was leaked to The Guardian, they, they said, you know, would it be possible if we judge it to be necessary for us to get rid of the anonymizing file and use um, use the IMEI numbers or whatever they're called, um, the specific device IDs to to basically be able to identify a person. And the reason get, that gets a bit spooky if it's used in conjunction with, with contact tracing. So let's say you, Jamie, have gone down the shops, just turns out someone else who's, they've identified as having coronavirus in that shop at that time. They're then are able to identify you and then, you know, I know this is kind of hysterical, this is very dystopian, but then you've got people knocking on your door saying, right, Jamie, you can't go anywhere because we've identified you as someone who's in the vicinity of someone else. You can just see it really encroaching on your civil liberties a little bit. But I, I grant you that's that's taking it several steps down the line. But I, I, I can see why people want to keep an eye on this stuff. I mean, uh, yeah. sorry, go on, Jamie. Yeah. To be perfectly honest, it's very, very easy to... Um, to um, uh de, de anonymized data anyway um like if it's tagged to your geolocation um it's really really simple uh and if you had a, a strong enough ai system you'd be able to figure out anyway um like all you've got to do is just figure out where the phone is stationary for four hours between the time of 1 a.m and 6 a.m and if it's um, uh, stationary for those periods at that time, you can safely assume that that is that person's home address. So all of a sudden, you've de, de anonymized the data. I mean, obviously, to do that manually would be incredibly difficult. But if you, but I mean, in today's world, I can't, I, I can't imagine it would take a PhD a uh, software engineer a particularly long time to write an algorithm that figures that out for you. Fair enough. Ian, what, what do you think about using smartphones in the fight against this sort of contact tracing and all that jazz? Yeah, I, I can. Yeah, it worries me a bit, I suppose. I'd be worried if I lived in China, um, where it's... I mean, it, I watched... A, I remember watching a sort of mini Facebook documentary that some... Western filmmaker put together recently showing like the level of surveillance that goes on at the chi in China at the moment. And it's quite staggering. I mean, it, it kind of shows you how 
they have got on top. I mean, they, we don't know, obviously. There's a lot, a lot of sort of um, people saying maybe the data isn't accurate and what, what can we believe. But, but if they have been able to get on top of it quickly, then you can sort of see how from the technology that they've been using to, to do things like this. And, you know, in a country that doesn't have our, doesn't have our sort of um, freedoms and, you know, the, 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 the kind of democratic norm that we take for granted, then that's, that's, uh, that's a worrying thing. It worries me a bit here, I suppose. I mean, it's not specifically to do with this app. I just think this whole thing is bringing a, a level of state intrusion and intervention into people's lives that we haven't seen for a very long time. And, and that's probably, I think we talked about this before, it's probably going to stay, I think, when the pandemic passes, it, it will be there for a long, long time. And that's not something that I like the idea of particularly. You'd be you'd be surprised though. So um, yeah, okay. If you, I I like to I like to take things, um, but that people are being genuine as well. I don't assume that people are lying or trying to screw us uh, on, on on the surface. And if you actually, and so basically, in all of these um, applications and all the conditions that are being made uh, for using this data. It has to be. It ha they're, they're, they're agreeing to delete all this data once we've passed this state of emergency, and this is part of the thing that um, the European Data Super uh, Data Protection Supervisor has been saying um, about uh, why it's G GDPR compliant. Um, you know, firstly, it's GDPR compliant because um, extraordinary circumstances allow for new applications of data analysis. You know, um, for it to be GDP, uh, GDPR compliance, there has to be a valid reason um, for you to an analyze the data in a certain way. And fighting COVID-19 is a very valid reason to do it. But he's also turned around and says, you've got to write in clauses that all this data has to be deleted once you once we've actually got through this, um, um, got through this. Uh, you know this outbreak so I completely get where you're coming from in the sense that it might lead to something but I think that we're, we're in such a, um, a pro-privacy uh, uh, regulatory um, environment and I know some people are trying to get rid of that I think I think we're going to be okay yeah it's not it's not specifically to do with this app it's, it's just a, a sort of broader I mean little things that that bother me like and we've talked again about this before derbyshire police sending out drones and sort of you know spotting people out walking their dogs in the peak district in the middle of nowhere and putting tweets about it on on messages or and you see this happening in london a little bit you know people phoning neighbors up and and sort of complaining about somebody who's gone out of the house a few times and then the police get have a word with them you can sort of see how technology would help them do things like that and at the moment we're all struggling with this because we don't know what you know we're, we're in a bit of an unusual situation i think to the rest of europe in that we don't want to go down that hard lockdown route we want to be a bit more relaxed about it so not doing things that france has done where you have to print off a form saying that you're going shopping every day and and, and which which obviously then it's there's a lot more interpretation of what the police actually do and there's a lot there's a lot of uncertainty but it's quite a controversial area i think there are people who are bothered about them overstepping the mark and about you know, people who might not have big gardens just going out for an extra stroll during the day and getting picked up and, and fined. And so it's not it's not specifically to do with this app. I can just see how technology would sort of aid some of these things that I find a little bit sinister and unappealing. Yeah, and it, it's, sorry, go on, Jamie. Yeah, but this is, again, again, I mean, this isn't new though, is it? I mean, this isn't, um, you know, all these arguments are emerging, but it's not something that we haven't argued about before, if that makes sense. You know, realistically, people, talk, people, um, you know, ratting on their neighbours and spying on their neighbours and going, oh, they, they're, they're doing this and they're doing that more often than that, uh, anyone else. You know, there's a reason the phrase curtain twitchers exists and probably a reason the Daily Mail exists. You know, you've got, you've got a lot of the, a lot of these things are already happening. They're just arguments that are brought to the surface because of coronavirus. Like, you know, surveillance it was always a worry. Um, I don't think it was heightened by coronavirus. I just think it was brought, the, the, the argument was brought to the front of the newspapers. Um, 
you know, you know, um, people. I, I can't think of any other examples, but I think it's just underlying uh, long-term issues that have always been bubbling away that have just been brought to the front of the newspapers. Um, you know, you pay enough attention to privacy, and you know, Max Schrems has been talking about this sort of thing for seven, eight, nine years. You know, when was when did Safe Harbor get taken down because of uh, because it was proven inadequate to protect European rights? Um, and replaced by the EU privacy shields. You know these privacy things have been going on for ages. I think they've brought they've been brought forward and been and people are actually paying attention because it's cool. Yeah, I, one thing I I would add to that is just the the different circumstances in the space of a month. Um, we've had a we've had a more fundamental change to how things are done and how people view the relationship between the individual and the state. That I can remember in my sadly nearly half a century of being alive, um, and so that's while you're completely right, Jamie. These aren't new issues. I think what is new is um, cultural, public, and institutional attitudes to them. Um, I was looking at something. I haven't written it up because this doesn't do with telecoms. But I was looking at a survey, and uh, about you know what people think about um, their attitudes towards public institutions. And in the UK, you know, our trust in public institutions, in the government, obviously in the health service, but in other public institutions has, has shot up. So, and they will be aware of this. So basically, we as a population are, are more suggestible right now to having new regulations, new state intrusions into our lives than we ever have been. And, they, and the state will be aware of that. My, um, my grounds for optimism actually come from technology. I think, you know, you talk about those Derbyshire um, sort of sending drones to spy on people. What was it? There were a couple of constabularies were tweeting about how we're going to check your shopping when you come out of Tesco's. And if you bought too much frivolous shit, you're in trouble. All this incredibly um, petty, intrusive stuff. But that stuff all gets onto social media straight away. And then you get an immediate public outcry. So I think you've got this, you've got this tension between the, the state bureaucracies, which are always going to want to increase their power. There's nothing new there. It always happened. I mean, we didn't stop. A lot of wartime um, restrictions didn't stop until the 50s in the UK. Um, it may have been necessary. It may, have been, it may not have been. But, you know, these things tend to drag on. But unlike in late 1940s UK, we've got social media. Everyone's a citizen journalist. We've got everyone keeping an eye on stuff. There was some viral video some northerner got his door kicked in by the cops because someone had grasped him up for having a party turned out he's doing nothing and he's videoed the whole thing and he's giving them all this northern abuse back you know and, and the police know they're being filmed they didn't to their credit didn't even ask him to set a camera down they've also been trained to assume that someone's always going to be filming them on their smartphones but it doesn't stop them often doing quite silly stuff so i think that's what's going to happen i think we're going to have the the state is going to want to intrude into our lives more, but you're going to get a lot of pushback from individuals. I think this has brought out, I've got a mate of mine who's a real statist who suddenly turned into this libertarian. Um, and he's, and he's going around, you know, um, sort of complaining about the state now. So it's making a lot of people re rethink things. And I think that tension is going to exist for quite a while. And it's going to be fascinating to watch it play out. Cool. All right, I'm going to take that silence as a sign to shut up and call it a day. Um, uh, yeah, okay, well, thanks for that, guys. Thanks for holding the thought while I was gone. Especially to you, Jamie. Your, uh, your uh, crazy scouser story got loads of reads, so nice one there. Um, and thank you very much for listening, and make sure you join us for the next one.